In this video, we're going to talk about cell cycle regulation. We need to be able to make sure that mitosis occurs at the right rate so that we can replace old cells and we can grow and we can repair injuries. If the cell cycle is not regulated, then we can end up growing excess of cells and that can form a tumor. If we form a tumor, there's two kinds of tumors. A benign tumor is not cancerous and it doesn't spread. An example would be something like a mole where there's an excessive number of cells but it's not cancerous. Sometimes benign tumors can become cancerous but generally they're harmless. If you have a malignant tumor then a malignant tumor can spread and that is cancer. In this slide we can see that we have a tumor that has formed in the tissue. These are malignant cancer cells, so that means that they can spread. When cancer cells spread, that is called metastasis, and or metastatic cells. Metastases is plural. And when these cells spread, the two main ways that they would spread is through the lymphatic vessels or through blood vessels. Cancer cells can produce digestive enzymes that break down the matrix outside of cells that allows them to migrate. I want to also point out in this slide, here we have a healthy region of tissue. And note that in healthy tissue, there's multiple different kinds of cells. And all of these different cell types have different kinds of functions. So if these are columnar epithelial cells, and we have maybe some cuboidal epithelial cells, maybe some fibroblasts, different kinds of cells are going to have different kinds of functions that make this tissue function normally. And notice over here when we have malignant cancer cells, they are all the same. And generally over time, they will lose their ability to function like the tissue that they once began as. So cancer cells develop from normal cells that overgrow and form a tumor. Over here, you can see a tissue sample. Sometimes we can have biopsies taken of lumps that we can feel, and you can look microscopically at the different cells, and you could potentially see cancer cells. And this is showing an x-ray. There's a, a tumor inside this brain. So why do tumors form? Why would these cells suddenly form a mass. The root cause of cancer is DNA mutations. We have all kinds of different genes that regulate multiple different things. For example, genes that regulate the cell cycle. We have genes that increase or decrease the rate that cells will reproduce based on need. If the tissue is growing, if we have injuries to repair, the cell cycle should be regulated. We have genes that repair DNA. DNA mutations can sometimes occur through DNA replication. The enzyme that produces new DNA called polymerase, this enzyme can sometimes put the wrong nucleotide in. So we have DNA repair enzymes that can fix those mistakes. If there's a mutation in a repair enzyme, then mistakes can't be fixed. We have genes that will trigger apoptosis. This is a programmed cell death process. This is important because cells will eventually accumulate DNA mutations or they'll get old and they won't function properly. It is important for apoptosis to occur so that those mutated cells don't continue going through cell division. And lastly, the immune response. We have immune cells called natural killer cells that will kill cancer cells if they do develop. We have all of these safety mechanisms. We regulate the cell cycle, we can fix mutations, we can kill cells that have too many mutations. And if those cells do develop into cancer cells, we have immune cells that can get rid of them. If the immune response is not regulated, then cancer cells can grow unchecked. 
What kinds of things can cause DNA mutations? Why would those genes be mutated? One of the things that I mentioned was during DNA replication. Polymerase can sometimes make mistakes. We have a few different ways of dealing with that. Polymerase itself can fix some of the mistakes that it makes. We have DNA repair enzymes that can fix some of those mistakes. Also, sometimes DNA can be mutated by substances. DNA repair enzymes can fix some of those as well. And then we can inherit some mutations. Sometimes we get DNA that has mistakes from the sperm or the egg. There are a lot of substances that can be very damaging to DNA. I have a chart that is going to list some of the most common kinds of carcinogens. A carcinogen is something that mutates DNA and causes cancer. In this list, some things are more likely to cause cancer than other things. Everything is dose dependent, right? We can handle a certain amount of exposure to things because our body has mechanisms for getting rid of toxins and for repairing DNA or getting rid of cells that are damaged. Different kinds of carcinogens are categorized as category one, two, or three based on how likely they are to cause cancer. So some things are only going to cause cancer in huge amounts or long-term exposure. And different people have different responses to different kinds of carcinogens. Radiation, that would be things like x-rays, dioxins, tobacco, smoke, aflatoxin I want to point out. This one is interesting because this is why we roast nuts. Different kinds of um, aflatoxin fungus can grow on raw nuts and it can be quite carcinogenic. Formaldehyde, um, certain viruses, HIV, HPV and hepatitis are the most common viruses that can cause DNA mutations. Um, these ones are a little bit sad. Benzopyrene when you char barbecued meat. Um, oh, fun fact though, if you have really healthy gut bacteria, they can help get rid of some of those carcinogens. So you can have a little bit of charred meat. Acrylamide in starchy foods. So when you cook starchy, fatty foods like french fries and potato chips at really high temperatures, it produces a substance called acrylamide, which over time is going to mutate DNA. Um, growth hormone, recombinant bovine somatotropin. This is not legal in Canada, so we don't have to worry about our dairy, but sometimes growth hormone is given to cows in the US, so be careful if you're buying dairy products that have come from the US. Having extra growth hormone would stimulate the growth of cells. Excessive UV light. So this is the sun. We need to have a certain amount of sunlight because we produce vitamin D. Vitamin D helps our immune system. So having some vitamin D is going to be advantageous for having a healthy immune response. The last thing that I want to point out is chronic inflammation. This is a really important process because during a chronic inflammatory response, this is when inflammation is going on longer than is healthy. So an acute inflammatory response, we repair tissues, we have red and heat and swelling and those signs of an inflammatory response. But when that goes on for long periods of time, then the immune system is constantly sending growth signals to those cells. And that can increase the rate of cell division to a level that could potentially stimulate cancer cell growth. For example, somebody that has an inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis, there is a constant inflammatory response going on, sending growth signals to those cells, and those people would have a higher risk of bowel cancer. Of all the deaths in Canada each year, 30% are due to cancer. In Canada, about 87,000 people die per year from cancer. This is the second leading cause of death in Canada and in the world. That's about 10 people every hour that are dying from some kind of cancer. Globally, 
It is also the second leading cause of death after cardiovascular disease. That works out to about 9.6 million people. That's how many people died from cancer in 2018. We have about 7.8 billion people on the planet right now. There's a normal death rate. Right now, about 56 million, 57 million people die every year for some reason. 9.6 million of those are because of cancer. The top four types of cancer are lung, prostate, breast, and colorectal cancer. And interestingly, lifestyle factors play a very significant role. The National Cancer Institute has come up with a list of the risk factors that are the most common in the development of cancer. Only about 5 to 10% come from inherited gene mutations. Many of the other things are either exposure to carcinogens or smoking. Smoking is highly correlated with lung cancer. Excessive alcohol is associated with several different kinds of cancers, including liver, stomach, esophagus, and mouth cancer. Now, these factors are all related Chronic inflammation that I already touched on. Chronic inflammation increases the growth of cells. So the immune system can stimulate mitosis because your immune system is trying to repair that tissue. If this goes on too long, then you have excessive growth signals. Obesity contributes to inflammation. Obesity and inflammation are interlinked. If you decrease obesity, then you decrease inflammation. Or if you decrease inflammation, then it is easier to lose weight. These are, these are connected. Diet is connected to inflammation. Trans fat and sugar increase inflammation. And we need to eat plant foods. Plant foods help to decrease inflammation. And then hormones. Hormones like estrogen also send growth signals and fat cells make estrogen. I wanna focus on the cell cycle. There are genes that increase the cell cycle and genes that um, produce proteins that help to decrease the cell cycle. These need to be in balance so that we have the right amount of cells growing at the right time in the right tissues. Proto-oncogenes increase cell division and tumor suppressor genes decrease cell division. When we have proto-oncogenes, let's suppose a proto-oncogene becomes mutated. If a proto-oncogene is mutated, then it is called an oncogene. Oncology is the study of cancer. So an oncogene will increase the rate of cell division too much, and then tumors can grow. On the other side, tumor suppressor genes, if we mutate a tumor suppressor gene and we don't stop the cell cycle, then tumors can grow. So we can produce cancer cells if we have increased oncogenes or decreased tumor suppressor genes. Let's go back and look at the cell cycle. Earlier in another video, we talked about how we have a growth phase and then we have S phase, this is when DNA replicates. And then we have a G2, which is another growth phase, and this is preparation for mitosis. And then we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis, and we produce two new cells. This is our normal cell cycle. What I want to point out is that we have checkpoints throughout the cell cycle. There are three specific checkpoints. One is in G1. We have one in G2, and we have one during mitosis, specifically during metaphase. The G1 checkpoint is where the cell looks at the DNA. We have genes that produce proteins that look at the DNA and make sure there are no mutations before we go into S phase. If everything is fine, then we replicate the DNA and we go into the next phase. Then we have a G2 checkpoint, and we look to see if the DNA that has replicated has replicated properly and that there are no mistakes. 
If the DNA looks good, then we move into mitosis and we have one final check of the DNA to make sure everything lined up properly and then the cell cycle will continue. If at any of these points there are DNA mutations, the cell cycle should stop so that we don't continue to replicate a cell that has mutations. I want to focus on one specific tumor suppressor gene called P53 and how it affects the cell cycle. Here we have a DNA strand. Let's suppose there's a DNA mutation. Now this DNA mutation is going to be detected at a checkpoint. It will be detected at the G1 checkpoint because it is there before the DNA replicates. So the molecule P53 is going to find this mutation and it will stop the cell cycle at the G1 checkpoint because P53 is a tumor suppressor gene so it stops the cell cycle. When P53 itself is a normal functioning gene it will find DNA mutations. One, it stops the cell cycle and number two, it can recruit DNA repair enzymes. P53 itself is not a DNA repair enzyme, but it can trigger DNA repair enzymes to come and fix this mistake. Now, two things can happen. One, the DNA mutation can be fixed. The cell is now normal. The cell will go through mitosis and produce two normal daughter cells. Or, the DNA mutation cannot be fixed. Sometimes DNA repair enzymes can't fix the mistake. Then what will happen is P53 has a third function and it will trigger apoptosis. Apoptosis is normal programmed cell death and now this mutated cell does not exist. So that is what P53 should normally do. Stop the cell cycle, try to recruit repair enzymes to fix the mistake. If the mistake can't be fixed, it will trigger apoptosis. Okay, normal process. Now let's suppose P53 itself was mutated. Then P53 would not find this mistake it would not stop the cell cycle at G1, and mitosis would continue. S phase would occur, the DNA that's mutated would replicate, and then two options occur. The mutated cell could survive and be non-cancerous, or that mutated cell could be a cancer cell. If P53 itself becomes mutated, the probability of producing cancer cells dramatically increases. What happens if we produce mutated cells? We produce mutated cells all the time. We always have DNA mutations. We accumulate DNA mutations just from living for our entire life. As we age, the probability of having cancer increases because we accumulate more DNA mutations over time. Our body can deal with quite a lot of mutations though. So one of the things that will happen, if we mutate DNA, we can use tumor suppressor genes to stop the cell cycle. We can try to fix the mistake. Or if that mutated cell is replicated, then we can trigger apoptosis and we can kill the cell that reproduced, that shouldn't have. And then our third mechanism is to use the immune cells. We have natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells that can kill mutated cells. So we have a lot of redundancy. We have a lot of ways of either trying to fix the mistakes or get rid of the cells that are mutated. And if we, if all of those systems fail, then cancer cells can develop.